Good morning, folks, and welcome to today's broadcast sponsored by Still Pond and Betterton United Methodist Churches. I'm Pastor Bill reminding you to visit our website, stillbetterchurch.org, to find our convenient online option for your church giving. And you'll also find our Sunday worship times. Betterton Church begins their worship at 9 a.m., and Still Pond Church begins theirs at 10.30 a.m. We look forward to seeing you there real soon. Next Sunday morning at 8.30 a.m., we invite you to join us for our annual Mother's Day breakfast at the Betterton Volunteer Fire Company. Good food and the Word of God will be on the menu in this celebration for Mom. This will be a combined worship service for our two churches, and our guest speaker is Ginny Story. She's got quite a Mother's Day story to tell you, and we wouldn't want you to miss that. So pack up the kids, bring Grandma and Grandpa, bring Mom and Dad, and bring a hearty appetite for good food and the good book. Remember, next Sunday morning at 8.30 a.m., Betterton Volunteer Fire Company, annual Mother's Day breakfast. Everyone is welcome to join us. And just in case if you're wondering, though the breakfast is scheduled at 8.30 next week, we will still bring you this morning's broadcast at 8 a.m. as usual. This broadcast consistently reaches out to more than 50 people each week. And if you can't join us in person in our sanctuaries or at next morning, uh, Sunday morning breakfast, we hope you will continue to listen in on this program every Sunday morning. And we thank you for your kind support. Let's begin this morning's program with a word of prayer, shall we? Gracious God, we humbly seek you with our whole heart. But sometimes the world around us blinds our vision of who you really are. Your love is revealed in your only begotten Son, Jesus. By his death we have been saved, and in his resurrection we are redeemed. We have trouble seeing what that really means, Lord. By your Holy Spirit, hope in the eyes of our hearts that we may truly know your grace and your mercy. And we ask this in Christ's name, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today I'd like you to open your Bibles at home there. Turn to the book of Acts. We're going to read from chapter 9 today, verses 1 through 20. Again, it's the book of Acts in the New Testament, chapter 9, and verses 1 through 20. Now, most of us are familiar with today's passage reading of Saul's conversion. And as we read it today, I invite you to open your minds a little bit and view yet another perspective of this story. So, let us hear the word of God according to Luke, where he begins at verse 1, saying, Meanwhile... Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. He said, that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether they were men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? And Saul asked, Well, who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias! And he answered, Yes, Lord. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. 
And Ananias answered him and said, Lord, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, and placing his hands upon Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell, off, fell from Saul's eyes, and he, and he could see again. And he got up, and he was baptized, and after taking some food, he, food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in, in Damascus, and at once, immediately, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. From the lyrics of Francisca Asuncion, let us pray. Dear Lord, lead me day by day. Make me steadfast, wise, and strong. Happy most of all to know that my dear Lord loves me so. Dear Lord, lead me day by day. Make me follow and obey. Faithfully your words of life, that your love ever abide. Amen. You know, seeing that I'm still recovering from eye surgery, it was only a matter of time before I, I titled a sermon, Double Vision. You know, diplopia is the medical term for double vision. And more specifically, I was experiencing exotropia, which is an outward turning of the eyes. Where most double vision is seeing two of the same object, my eyes were so far out of alignment that I was seeing one object with one eye and another object with the other. Now imagine my feeble brain trying to distinguish which object to process. You know, it caused many headaches, and many of them in the past year. Apparently, I've had this condition all my life and never knew it. I never knew I had a problem with the sight. I just figured everyone else saw things the same way I did. You see, my brain and my eye muscles were always able to train this lazy right eye to focus with the dominant left. But I've not been able to control the eye muscles for almost a year now. And thick, <laughs> thick Coke bottle bottom glasses wasn't going to fix the problem. The experts at Wilmer Eye Institute of Johns Hopkins Hospital surgically repaired my eyesight, eyesight with a radical procedure. Essentially, they adjusted the alignment of my eyes, sort of like lining up headlights on an automobile. Modern medical marvels will never cease to amaze me, and I'm, on, I'm most grateful for the physicians and those technicians who got me seeing more clearly now. While reading today's scripture passage this week, it dawned on me that Saul, the Pharisee, also had double vision, but in a different sense. His life's vision was to uphold the Mosaic laws and the Jewish traditions of religion. He was studious, he was smart, and he was zealous to carry out one particular mission, to gather as many Christians as possible for punishment and or death at the hands of of the religious leaders in Jerusalem. His focus was set beyond the borders of Israel, and he asked permission to go as far as Damascus, which is in Syria. His hopes were to stop the spread of this new radical understanding of God through Jesus of Nazareth. And being a stickler for details, he went to the high priest to get permission to do so. You know, Jesus cured a lot of afflicted people. Some were crippled and some were lepers. Some were deaf and mute. And he even gave sight to the blind. And in one instance, the man was blind from birth. He had never seen the light of day. And on the Sabbath, Christ took the dirt from the ground and he spat into his palm and he created a salve. And then he smeared this earthen salve into the blind man's eyes 
telling him to go to the pool at Siloam and then wash off his eyes. And when the blind man followed his instructions, the sight he never had was given to him instantly. And when folks asked him who gave him his sight, the man said, I don't know. I mean, how could he know? He was blind. He couldn't see Jesus. And when the Pharisees questioned him, they tried to finger Jesus for working on the Sabbath. They were hell-bent on finding some way to convict and imprison this Nazarene. They called Jesus, listen to this, they called Jesus the man without sin, the Son of God. They called him a sinner. But the man with new eyesight, he told the Pharisees, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I once was blind, but now I see. In Saul's case, he was not physically blind, he, but he was blinded by ambition, so much so that he, he could not see that the Holy Spirit was living and working in the followers of Christ. His hatred for the people of the way was so great that he had convinced himself he was obeying God's commandments by breaking those very same commandments just to satisfy his ambition. Let me say that again. He had convinced himself he was obeying God's commandments by breaking those very same commandments just to satisfy his ambition. In other words, he was gathering Christians together to be executed. And that kind of goes against thou shalt not kill, doesn't it? Though he could see, his vision of who God really is was blurred. And Christ knew that the only way to change Saul's heart was so to physically blind him altogether by a radiant and a glorious light from heaven. And to be sure Saul gets the message, the risen Christ speaks to him saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul, who's perplexed at this blinding light and the voice from heaven, he asks, who are you, Lord? And where the blind man I mentioned earlier didn't know who had healed him, Jesus makes sure Saul knows that it is the Messiah who is now taking his sight away. But this blindness is only temporary. Three days later, Ananias is sent by the Lord to Saul in Damascus. And laying his hands upon him, he calls him, get this, Brother Saul. And in a miracle, the Pharisee regains his sight. But it is a new sight. It's a new vision. You see, Paul's, Saul's focus is now on Christ Jesus. It's not on his personal ambition. And as a result of that miraculous healing, Saul begins preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in the synagogues immediately. Saul, Saul was well trained in Jewish tradition and the Mosaic laws. And last week we mentioned he was a student of Gamaliel, the most famous teacher of Hebrew theology at that time. You know, someone once wrote that a student learns what the teacher knows, but a disciple becomes what the master is. Saul, who soon became known as Paul, was no longer a student of Gamaliel. He was on the road to Damascus. He had become a disciple of Jesus Christ. He once was spiritually blind, but now he sees the light of the world. You know, like Paul, we have our moments of double vision as well. And in most cases, that vision is much like my exotropia, in that we want to see God working in our lives, but the things of this world are also in our field of view. We struggle to focus on one or the other. And in most cases, we end up turning a blind eye to God. You know, ever since I can remember, because of my impaired vision, I've squinted my right eye in bright light. As my diplopia became more severe, I found myself nearly closing my right eye altogether during the late hours of the day. And in doing this, I was then seen with only my left eye. And because of that, I'd lost all depth perception. Sometimes the light of the world, Jesus Christ, seems too bright for us to focus on him. We squint our eyes just enough to get a little bit of light in, but we're afraid to be fully illumined by his glory. 
in that limited view, we lose our perception of the depth of God in our lives. And our lives become shallow. They become empty. And they might come without any, become without any meaning. We might as well be in total darkness. But thanks be to Christ, we have a restored vision, a restored relationship with God. His death on the cross of Calvary was in full view of the people in Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago. And his crucifixion is still in full view today. But it is the risen Christ that is our vision of hope for everlasting life. Jesus told a doubting Thomas, you know, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet they believe. You know, those of us who have faith in Christ today, we fall into that category. Our double vision becomes singular and focused entirely on Jesus. Sure, we have our moments when we look at ourselves, we look at our lives, even our selfish ambitions. But when we look at the world through the eyes of a heart filled with God's Holy Spirit, we are then able to look beyond our sins. And we're able to look beyond other people's sins as well. And we're able to look towards the kingdom of God. Friends, don't squint when Jesus shines his light upon you. Open your eyes that you may see glimpses of truth God has for thee. Christ can radically change your view of who God really is in your life. And if you faithfully see him with the eyes of your heart, you'll experience that here and now. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, forgive us when we turn a blind eye unto your glory. We don't mean to do so. We, we fall victim to our human nature. Lord, enlighten us with the truth that is Jesus Christ. And God is to be a reflection of that truth to those around us. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's closing thought. Jacob Koshi of Singapore. He was an ambitious man who sought to gain as much money and worldly possessions as he possibly could. His zeal for living life in the fast lane led him into a world of illegal drugs and gambling. And in 1980, he was arrested and placed in a government rehabilitation prison. Now, everything he had ever hoped for was now just a dream that was locked up with him in this tiny little cell. He grew impatient at his heart, as his heart ached with a cold emptiness, and his only relief was smoking cigarettes, but they were not allowed, they were not allowed to do that in that rehabilitation center. So Jacob found a way to have tobacco smuggled into the prison. The only problem was he didn't have any rolling papers. Seeing the Gideon Bible that was placed in his cell, he rolled his cigarettes with pages torn out of that Bible. And one day he fell asleep while smoking one of his roll your owns. And when he woke up, he discovered the cigarette had burned out, leaving only a scrap of the charred paper. And when he unrolled the scrap, he read these words, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? And apparently the passage made him curious, so much so that he asked for another Bible and he searched tirelessly for the chapter and verse that contained that question. And when he found it, he read the entire story surrounding the conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus. It was then that he realized that if God could change the heart of a man who hated Christians so much into one of the greatest Christian leaders ever, then maybe God could change his heart too. He knelt down in his tiny cell, a cell that once housed his hateful existence and his lost dreams, and he turned his entire life over to Christ. And from then on, he became a witness to many other prisoners. He shared his story and helped others come to Christ as well. And when Jacob Koshi was released from the center, he met a Christian woman, he got married, and is now a missionary in the Far East. Today, he tells people far and wide, who would have believed that I could find the truth by smoking the word of God? You know, to the Jews who believed in Jesus once said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. 
Kashi found freedom not only from his prison cell, he found it also from the cold, empty promises of his selfish ambition. In a response to that freedom, he shared the truth that is the gospel of Jesus Christ to many others. And from what I hear, he's still doing so today. Such was the case with the Apostle Paul. He too was imprisoned in his personal ambitions of one day being a respected Pharisee and a member of the prestigious Sanhedrin. It was only after Christ blinded his ambition that he was able to see the truth. And three days after he was, three days after he was blinded by the light, he regained his sight to see the light of the world. And he became a reflection of that light throughout Asia Minor and, and parts of Europe. He was paving the way for the conversion of Gentiles and Jews. And you know what? That legacy continues today. Blind ambition leads us to a prison-like existence as well. We become so wrapped up in selfish goals that we forget God's love given to us through Christ crucified. And when Jesus died on the cross, we were saved from certain death. And in his resurrection, we are redeemed. We are free to leave that prison cell of sin. So friends, the cell door is open. Christ is calling you. Are you willing to step into the light? Open your eyes. See the truth. And follow Jesus into everlasting life. Don't let your souls go up in smoke. Free them forevermore in Christ Jesus. We hope you can join us for worship in our sanctuaries real soon, but if you can't, that's okay. You can always tune in next Sunday morning at 8 a.m. for another broadcast. And until then, go in peace, and may the peace of God go with you. Amen.